So recently I came across a video series from Coach Curtis called Midlane Fundamentals. And I was wondering what are the jungle equivalent of these fundamentals? So today I've made my own series of jungle fundamentals. And today we're gonna to be covering jungle pathing. So if you take a look above me at the table of contents, today we're gonna to be covering what actually is pathing. We're gonna be looking at pathing theory. This is when you're in loading screen and you're actually deciding where you should be pathing. We're gonna take a look at split map pathing, invade paths, defensive pathing, denying the enemy on your first base, and pathing for objectives. I'm going to be breaking down all of these throughout the video, what they are and how to do them. So let's get into it. So let's kick things off with what is pathing? Pathing is the order in which the jungler farms their camps. Pathing is all about understanding your champion and the types of paths which are best for them. So let's have a look at the examples down here below. First off, we've got a Hecarim here. And Hecarim, he's going to be going to his red buff first, his Krog second, his Raptors third, then Wolves, then Blue, Gromp, and finishing with a Scuttle. Now, Hecarim is a power farming jungler. This is understanding your champion, what he wants to do. He's going to full clip. Now, if we look at the example over to the left, we're going to see a Nidalee. And Nidalee is a fast clearing jungler that has gank power. So she's actually going to do the exact same type of clear as Hecarim because she likes the clearer camp. She does them fast. But then instead of going for Scuttle, she's going to end it with a top gank. And this is just the differences between champions. It's about understanding your champion and knowing what paths are best for them. And finally, pathing allows you to balance farming your jungle while also impacting the map by ganking or making objectives. So again, Nidalee can play for ganks, Hecarim can play for these objectives like Scuttle, later into the game Dragons, all these things. This is what makes up pathing. So now let's transition over to the most important part of the video, which is pathing theory. I'm going to be referring back to this throughout the entire video because it's what makes up all my decision making when it comes to my pathing. And what actually is pathing theory? It is how I decide the path I'm going to take in every single game. So I've broken it down into four steps of thoughts and how you decide what paths you're gonna be taking. So the first thing we need to understand is what is our champion identity? Now, what do I mean by identity? I mean, what does my champion want to do in the game? Are we a late game team fighter? Are we an early ganker? Are we a power farmer? What does our champion excel at and how do we play towards that? So the first type of champion we're gonna look at is a level two champion. Something like a, a Jarvan, a Xin Zhao, they wanna gank, they wanna invade, they wanna create that early pressure. Something like a level three champion is next, similar to these level two champs, except they're more likely to gank, something like a Shaco, a Rek'Sai. Then over to power farmers, these champions like to put all of their camps on cooldown before making an impact in any single lane. And then finally, we have level six champs. Similar to those power farmers, but they have an extremely strong spike at level six, usually assassin champions. So we need to identify what our champion does and play towards those strengths. The second thing we need to take a look at is what is our jungle matchup? And we gotta ask ourselves questions like, what is the identity of the enemy champion? So we gotta identify, are we up against a Rek'Sai? Are we up against a Master Yi? What do they want to do? This is gonna allow us to react to that champion. If we're a power farmer up against a level three champion, we know that we're gonna to need to ping our laners to be safe and be respectful because we wanna get our camps and the enemy team wants to get early kills on lanes. Another question to ask yourself is how do they match up against my champion? So if I'm a level six champion like this Evelyn up against a Jarvan, I'm pretty likely to be getting invaded by that Jarvan. He wants to put me behind. His champion wins in the early game. Or if I'm on the vice versa, I'm the Jarvan, I want to destroy that Evelyn. So you need to understand how your champion interacts with the enemy jungler. The third thing we're going to be taking a look at is lane matchups. We're going to ask ourselves questions like, who on my team gets pushed? Does my top laner get pushed? Does my mid laner get pushed? Does my bot laner? The reason we ask who gets pushed is because it's who we can play around. If we are a Jarvan and we want to invade the enemy jungler, it's really good to play towards the side that has push. Imagine we have a Morgana and a Caitlyn bottom lane. They like to push. They have heaps of range over the enemy. If you're Jarvan and you invade the enemy jungle, that means your Morgana can leave lane and come and support you. 
or vice versa. Say you're an Evelyn and you need defense and you have that Caitlyn Morg on your team. You can path towards the Caitlyn and Morgana lane and Morgana can leave her lane and come support you in the jungle if you're getting invaded. So using push to your advantage, using your lane matchups to your advantage to play your jungle matchup to its ex the best extent it can. Another question you can ask yourself is who wins early skirmishes? Sometimes early pushing power isn't everything. Sometimes the fighting is what really makes the difference. Because for example, imagine your bot lane is not a pushing lane, but you have something that really skirmishes well, like a Lucian and a Braum. Lucian combines with Braum's passive autos really, really well to stun, deal a ton of damage. So even if they're up against the Caitlyn and a Morgana, if you end up taking a fight against them and all in a 3v3 in the river, that Lucian Braum is probably gonna win due to their early skirmishing power. So taking into account who has push early and who has power in skirmishes early is really important when deciding your pathing. And the final step is one of almost the easiest, but maybe also the hardest. It is combining all of this information together. So understanding your identity, understanding the enemy jungler and understanding your lane matchups, but also the enemy lane matchups, understanding maybe they can invade you. Maybe it's a Jace top and they're gonna push you in as the weak Evelyn or the weak Nocturne. So combining all that information to determine where you should path. So this is a lot of explanation, but now I'm actually gonna take you into in-game examples of how I break this down in a real match. So for example, number one, we are playing Jarvan on red side. So we know we're Jarvan on red side. Let's employ pathing theory, step number one. We've got to identify what our champion's identity is. Uh, and Jarvan, simply put, he is a level two champion. He's an early game champion. Once he hits one camp, he gets level two, he can provide a lot of pressure on the map. He gets his EQ, it deals tons of damage, and it provides CC. So he's a huge menace in the early game. So now that we've identified that, let's go on to step two. Let's look at our opponent jungler. Now, what is the identity of our opponent jungler? This is Diana. She is a power farmer. And how does she match up into us? Well, Diana actually has pretty good skirmishing power, but into Jarvan with my Conqueror matching hers, Jarvan is going to edge her out in the early game. So we're an early game champion with a winning matchup up against our opponent. So now onto our third step. This is going to be looking at the matchups. Now our laning matchups are, we've got Caitlyn and Lux in bottom lane. Huge range, huge pushing power up against Kai'Sa and Soraka. Two scaling champions can trade a little bit in the early game, but up against this Caitlyn Lux, they're definitely going to get out pressured. Looking up at the mid lane, we've got Lulu into Kiana. Now, Lulu has a tiny advantage level one. She's going to be able to push in Kiana, but as Kiana gets her levels, she's going to become scarier and scarier, and Lulu will have to play a little more defensively. Not too much to do in this lane. And then finally, looking at top lane, this is the danger zone. This is Volibear into Darius. Two huge trading champions. Volibear taking Knight in this matchup and Darius taking Ghost. So you know that these two are going to be fighting early and there's going to be lots to be done here. Step four, let's combine all of the information together. We've got huge pressure bot. We've got hard trading top and nothing really to look at in mid lane. So now we need to decide how we're going to actually play this game. Are we going to play to impact bottom lane early or are we gonna to play to impact uh, the top lane early? Now, I want you guys to pause the video for five seconds. I'll leave it in here and I'll edit and make it fancy, but pause for five seconds. Think about what you would do in this situation and then compare it to my answer after this. Okay, so this is a pretty tricky situation because when I have double huge priority lanes, I love to play to this bot lane, but this top lane is too irresistible to get away from. So what I'm gonna be doing in the early game, this game is I'm actually gonna start red. Now, why do I start red? Why do I not start blue and path up towards this Volibear lane? And the reason for that is I'm Jarvan. We identified that I'm a level two champion. So that means I can actually just start red and then I can instantly level two this Darius. Now I'm actually gonna show you here in the replay what I do. I start top side, I start red, 
I look to do my Krogs because I can't instantly walk to this lane. I want Volley Bear to do a little bit of trading on Darius first. So I do Krogs and then I look to gank top. I ping the Darius, but Volley Bear's hit level two. So Darius is respecting. So unfortunately, I'm actually not going to be able to pull off a gank here. But using my level two pressure and level two advantage over the enemy jungler, I also identified that Diana started red buff. I'm going to invade her blue here. And even if Diana comes here, I'm going to be able to fight her off with the pressure from my pushing top laner that I was able to secure by pathing to his lane. And now steal away this blue. So game number two here is going to be another freeze frame. We've got Evelyn on the blue side and we're going to be up against Belveth. Now this is completely different from the last game as Evelyn is a completely different style champion to Jarvan, but I'm just going to be showcasing how the rules of jungle pathing theory apply to all these champions. So as we look at Evelyn, what is she? What is her identity? She is a level six power farming jungler which basically means she's going to be really, really weak early. And we're going to be aiming to play as defensively as possible. Now, we're up against a Belveth. Belveth, actually similar to Evelyn in a sense. She is a power farmer. But Belveth does have early game strength in her really aggressive uh, Q usage, which is her dash, which allows her to get some early ganks off. She also can invade Evelyn early. So we are pretty afraid of her. So we've identified the enemy jungler. We've identified our jungler. This is the most complicated part. Let's talk about the lanes. So we have our tank Scion up against Shivana. Both pretty strong. I think Scion is going to be able to pressure out Shivana a tiny bit in the early game just because he has grasp and Shivana's opted for more scaling with press the attack. We're looking on to mid now. We have Katarina versus Kassadin. Now, this Kassadin is a counter pick into the Katarina because it's pretty hard for Katarina to get too much pressure into him early and Kassadin gets to scale for free. So there's not that much for us here in the early game. And then finally, this is the red flag. This is the most dangerous lane in the game. We've got Ash and Pike into Draven and Nautilus. Now, the glaringly obvious thing here is Draven and Nautilus is an incredibly strong lane. They are going to be super, super strong into this Ash Pike because Draven has taken cleanse so he can cleanse the exhaust and Nautilus is just an insane engage support up against this, um, this Ash that has no mobility. So, the enemy team is probably going to be getting a lot of pressure through this bottom lane. And as Evelyn what is our goal? We are a power farming level six champion. So taking into account all of these things, let's put it together. I want to be pathing away from this strong lane. I don't want to be getting impacted by them. I want to be safely farming. I want to be hitting my six and influencing the game once I am actually strong. So I've kind of given it away, but I'm going to pause here. I'm going to allow you guys to think and process what would you do and how would you play this game? All right, so uh, it's pretty simple, but I'm going to be starting red buff this game. And the reason for that is Ash and Pike can leash me and I can path towards the safe lane where I get a tiny bit of pressure of Scion and Shivana. Now, the reason for this is because Belveth, she gets strong at level three. She can invade me and push me out of my jungle. So if Belveth opts to do a three camp on her top side and then invade me at my blue, at least I have passed towards my Scion who can come down and help me on my jungle camps and give me a little bit of a safer clear. If I opted to start blue buff this game and I path towards my bot lane of Ash Pike, yes, Pike can rotate really effectively, but so can Nautilus. And then by that point, Belveth would be level three and she can invade me with a Draven and a Nautilus and pummel my Ash if she ever gets left alone and Pike has to come to me. So this game, I opt to path towards top. Also, I can influence the top matchup a little bit because Shivana does not have flash, which allows me to get free ganks off her in the early game. And this game fortunately goes abs absurdly perfect for me. I'm going to start red buff. I'm going to start red buff. I'm going to full clear all the way up without any pressure. 
I'm going to secure the even Scuttle Crab, which is pretty rare as Evelyn. And we're going to path all the way to top. And we see Scion taking great trades. I don't need to show uh, you all of the video for you to really understand how this is going to play out. But I skip ahead. Shivana starts trading with Scion. I flash on her and I kill her. So now I'm playing Evelyn in a pretty scary game up against this Draven Nautilus. And now I've scale I'm scaling. I've got a kill in the early game. And I'm gonna be looking to re uh repath up to top side, hit my six, and then I'll impact that lane later. But that's how I plan my first clear. On to game three. So for the third and final example we've got for Pathing Theory, I want you guys to try and tackle this one yourselves. I want you to go through all the four steps we have and decide how you would play this game early in your Pathing, and then I'm going to tell you how I would do it. So just for clarification, I am Wukong on blue side this game, taking on this Lee Sin. Now I'm going to leave you this freeze frame. You decide what you would do, and then I'm going to tell you after what I would do. Okay, so now we're back. I'm going to be taking you through my thought process in real time of how I would do this uh, myself without the whole blah, 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 identify, blah, all the steps. I'm just thinking, okay, I'm Wukong. I'm really, really strong once I hit level three. Without my level three, I'm not really anything. Uh, similar to Lee Sin. Lee Sin wants his Q, his E, and his W to be strong. That's the first thing I see. We're pretty even. We're both level three champs. Nothing special there. I'm probably not going to get invaded. Uh, we've got Pike and Samira. Huge engage lane onto Sona and Jin. Sona and Jin have no escapes uh, up against a hard engage bot lane. So they're going to be getting pressured out a lot. And then the final thing I'm looking at here is Jax and Aatrox. Now Jax here... Uh, another melee matchup that we've seen before melee into Aatrox now Aatrox wants to trade early and win this matchup as you can see by him taking ignite but this uh, lane has a lot of CC set up for me and that's something I lack as Wukong so looking at this game I can't really influence this bot lane a lot and I know Lee Sin is going to want to start red buff and path down to his bot lane because it's free CC set up with Pike onto Sona and Jin. So I have two options here. I try and snowball harder than uh, the Lee Sin does on my bot lane this game and I path from red to top and try and farm this Aatrox because he has no TP. If we punish him, he's going to fall really far behind. Or I have the other option of I start blue buff and then I path all the way down to my red and I match Lee Sin on the bot lane in the 3v3. Now, my final nail in the coffin for my decision making here is even if I come down to defend this 3v3 and I come and join up with my bot lane, I'm pretty sure we still lose. So I opt to path red this game from red this game up towards the Aatrox with no TP and punish him uh, equal to Lee Sin punishing my bot lane. I'm handshaking the enemy Lee Sin say, hey, you can beat up my bot lane if you let me beat up my top lane. I don't think this is a fair trade. I think this is better for the Lee Sin, but ultimately... Jin is a utility champ, Sona is going to scale, and, and a head Jax versus this enemy team comp is going to be really, really nice. The only person who might be a problem for him is LeBlanc, but the rest of these champs, Jax can deal with nicely. So that's my thought process in this game. I have nothing to show you from the VOD, because long story short, I do path to top, and I think Jax solo kills Aatrox anyways. Uh, yes, he does. Uh, I think he trades one for one, but I end up full clearing and my bot lane dies. So my theory is correct and my predictions were pre correct, but it doesn't play out the way I want it to. So that's how I would think about this. And I hope you guys found a similar conclusion or thought of the similar things that I did. And if you didn't, I hope you're able to identify where maybe you missed a step or maybe I missed a step. Let me know in the comments if I did. Now into the next section. So now that we've spoken about pathing from a theory sense and how to break it down mentally and how to decide where you should be pathing in most of your games, let's talk about different types of paths and the reasons you should be using them. So the first one I've got for you here today is split map pathing or vertical jungling. Now, first off, what actually is this path? Uh, if we take a look down here at this example, split map pathing is simply when you go from one quadrant of your jungle 
to the opposite quadrant jungle, which is the enemy's jungle. And you can see it also uh, in this example here. So first things first, why do we do split map pathing? First reason could be the enemy has a weak and diveable lane. So if we take a look at this example down here, we have a really strong lane. We've got Draven and Nautilus on our team up against the really, really susceptible and gankable Jinx and Yumi. So a reason for us to do this, we would go from our red buff to the enemy blue buff say we're something strong like a kindred or a lee sin we would walk straight into the enemy jungle take these camps force the enemy jungle to go to the opposite side of the map and stay on the top side and this allows us to get free ganks and free dives onto this really weak lane and snowball very hard and speaking of snowballing we have a snowball heavy lane. This is another reason for us to do split map pathing. Now, if we take a look at this example over here, on our side, we have the Irelia. And Irelia is taking on Yorick. Now, if you don't know this matchup very well, simply put, it is really, really hard for Yorick. Irelia can snowball incredibly hard in this matchup. She kills Yorick's schools with her Q in one shot, so she's able to pa uh, stack up her passive and kill Yorick with ease. So, in this example, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be a level 3 jungler, something like a Kha'Zix or a Lee Sin. We're going to be taking our blue buff, we're going to be taking uh, our Gromp, we're going to be taking our Wolves, and then we're going to be invading the enemy jungle. We're going to be taking their Red, we're going to be taking their Raptors, and we're going to be taking their Krogs. Now, what this does, again, it forces the enemy jungle to go to the opposite side of the map. They can't come up here anymore because we've already taken their camps. And then this allows us to keep total pressure on this Yorick. Irelia can deny minions from Yorick. She can take really, really unfavorable trades for the Yorick. And we can set up dives to kill him under tower, ultimately dominating his lane and destroying this matchup. Now, keep in mind, as I said here, as it's written up here, why do we do this? And more so, how can we do this? We can do this when the enemy jungler is weak or weaker than us. So we do this when we are a strong champion, like a Kindred, like a Lee Sin, like a Kha'Zix level 3, maybe even a Rengar, where we can force these tanks out, force even strong duelist champions, but we just might be stronger in the individual matchup. We force them out and we play to deny these lanes. So now I've got an example to showcase this for you guys in an actual game of my own. So the first game I've got for you guys explaining split map pathing here is me playing Kindred. And now I'm playing Kindred up against Zack. Very, very easy one for us to break down. So let's talk about it. Kindred, a champion that spikes at level two. Really, really strong in the early game, invades hard, and is a just overall well-scaling duelist into the late game, but also has power in the early game. Now, let's look at our opponent. We've got Zack. Zack is a tank that scales and is incredibly weak in his early levels. He needs items to be strong, and he definitely needs levels to be strong. So, we already know in the 1v1, we are insanely strong and very favored up against the Zack but it's not all about the 1v1. We also have to look at our lanes. So let's have a look at them. First ones first, we have Lissandra up against Zed. Zed, a strong champion, but in the early game lacks push. And what does Lissandra have a lot of in the early game? She's got push. She stands there on the wave, she spams her Qs, and she's gonna be able to back up a Kindred, which is invading on red or blue, wherever she may be, Lissandra's always got your back because she has that move, she has that pressure in the early game on mid. Now, let's take a look at the other lanes. We've got Vayne and Sona up against R, Draven, and Yumi. Now, Vayne and Sona, two incredibly, incredibly well-scaling lanes, but only good in late. They don't have too much pressure early, especially up against the early game powerhouse that is Draven and even Yumi. Yumi's a really strong champion, level one. She can get a lot of pressure walking up, using her heal to trade um, and just sitting on Draven, allowing him to throw axes at this Vayne and Sona. They're gonna be able to get a lot of pressure in the 2v2. Now the final lane we've got to look at is Garen and Malphite, just tanks. Garen gets a little bit of pressure because he's got his knight, Ignite, he's got his Conqueror, so he can get pressure up there, but nothing too important for us to focus on. So now with all these things identified, it's time for us to figure out how we're actually going to invade this sack. So 
it's one minute into the game, so I didn't have the recording for the start of this, but if you take a look down here in the bottom right hand corner, you are going to see that I have got a ward here on the enemy blue buff. I've based and now I've got sweeper. So this is going to allow me to identify if Zack starts topside or he starts his blue. And this is going to allow me to define which path I'm going to be going for here. Am I going to be invading him directly on his Gromp or am I going to be just running straight, uh, straight to his blue and then looking to fight him when he's on his wolves? So here we see on the ward, on vision, we see Vayne is leashing Zack at blue. So now going through my head right here, I already know that this is going to be a split map path because I want to one, invade this Zack on the blue, but two, I want to be playing to this strong Draven matchup with Yumi that can snowball really hard into the weak early game of Sona and Vayne. So here we do red. We're going to drag it all the way to this dragon pit wall. Going to kill it. And now I'm going to jump over this wall and find Zack on his Gromp. We saw that Zack lent towards the Gromp here. And in most map, in most jungle champions here, guys, they don't kill this Gromp by the time uh, Kindred is able to invade. We see here now the Gromp is half HP. We're able to jump onto Zack, push him out. And he's kind of ruined from this at this point, honestly. Zack is chunked. He is now forced to base. He is a level two Zack needing to base to go to his top side. But we see here, Zack's actually looking to retaliate. So now that we've spoken about how we do this and pull this off, let's talk about uh, the, the response that we need to have here. Right now, what I'm doing in the game is I'm actually staring at mid lane and bot lane on the minimap. I'm thinking, who is rotating? Is Zed coming first? Is Lissandra coming first? Or is my bot lane coming? Who is on their way? So I'm just waiting. I see Zed is t uh, tippering off vision back and forth, but I know a wave is coming into him. So I know he can't rotate just yet. Zach's just sitting here trying to pressure me off this wall, so I'm starting them. I'm going to make him sweat a little bit. I see danger pings coming from bot, so I know Sona and Vayne are going to be here first. So with that information, me and Lissandra just start walking away from the bot lane. We take a good chunk onto Zed. So now Zed's lane is practically butchered. And now, if we take a look at the minimap, Draven and Yumi are able to respond. So Draven and Yumi are here. They're able to pick up Vayne on the backside. I walk back over because Zed has to go back to his mid lane to catch the minion wave. And Sona is out of position. She's got flash, so I'm going to catch her around the corner. Jump over this wall. And it's 2 minutes 50 into the game. Zach has one kill. Bot lane has been both killed. Draven has a kill. And this game is curtains from here. I was able to snowball this game and close it out. But that is how... One, to do a split map path, but two, how to take in information to decide where you should be playing and reactively respond in the moment in the fight. So now transitioning from split map pathing, we're going to be talking about invade pathing. Now looking at these diagrams I have here, you might be thinking invade pathing looks really similar to split map pathing. And they are similar in a sense, but they are also different and they are done for very different reasons. So what are they? First off, invade pathing is with the direct intent to find and punish the opponent jungler. So if we take a look at these diagrams down here, let's look at this Kindred one. We've got Kindred doing red buff and is looking to meet Evelyn on this Gromp. Actually, a similar example we just showed in the example for split map pathing. And then also another example here, the Lee Sin, he's a level three champion. So he's going to do one, two, three camps to get level three. And then he's going to invade Zach here on the red and find him and directly fight him, burning his flash, wasting his time, chunking him. So he has to base directly influencing the jungle matchup. Now split map pathing, you usually do it to influence the lanes that you're trying to split the map for so your strong bot lane or your strong top lane that is when split map pathing is employed and invade pathing is for when you went to mess up your individual jungle matchup now we've spoken about what it is why do we do it first of all when the enemy is a weak jungler pretty obvious one here you've got your eves your zacks your sejuanis your tanks your scalers all these champions that you want to influence early and put them behind they are the reasons to pull off an invade path why else would you pull off an invade path? You have really high pressure laners. So taking advantage of pressure of something like a Lucian or a Kiana. Lucian provides you early push and Kiana allows you to fight 2v2. She's got the skirmishing power that you need at level three when you're invading. 
Another reason you might want to do an invade path is just because you are a strong jungler. You don't even have the strong lanes, but you are strong enough to take that 1v1 without any influence from your laners. You're these Kindreds, your Jarvans, your Rengars, your Lee Sins, all these early game powerhouses with the damage to back you up, influencing these matchups. This is why you should invade path. So how do we actually do it? It's really simple. We've spoken about it before in our theory section. Identify what type of champion you are. Are you a level two champion? In this diagram, we've got Kindred, the level two champ. She does a level two path. She goes from red straight to the Gromp to fight the Eve Evelyn. Level three champion, just like this diagram. Now this diagram doesn't show all, all paths, but it pretty much summarizes the, the essence of what you're gonna be doing. You're gonna be hitting level three, you're gonna be finding where the enemy jungler is and fighting them on their buff. So determine which camp to invade depending on the ju enemy's jungle clear speed and their path. So exactly like this, if the enemy starts up on the top side, now you have to adapt, you have to invade them on the bottom side of his jungle, all these things, see where they're starting, look at who's leashing, find them and adapt and find where you need to be to pull off that invade. So I'm going to pull up now an example of myself pulling off an invade path and the reasoning behind it and all the factors I took into account to decide to do this path. Okay, so for the example of my invade path, I have got the ultimate invade champion. I've got Xin Zhao. Xin Zhao is an incredibly powerful early game champion, super high base stats with the ability to walk into the enemy jungle and cause a havoc. And we're up against Diana. Now let's break down what Diana does. Diana is a full clear scaling champion. She's pretty decently strong in the early game, but nothing in comparison to Xin Zhao. And she just wants to scale, eat all her camps as fast as possible and play to those level six spikes, play at objectives, play around her team with huge damage and huge setup for everyone to follow up on. So I'm Xin Zhao. I'm strong in the early game. I have high damage pressure. I want to disrupt that. So how am I gonna do that? What's the best avenue for me to do this? So let's look at our lanes. Ezreal, center. Pretty weak in the early game. Senna needs to get her stacks to scale. Ezreal's a poke champion. Poke champions don't too, uh, do too well without some items. So I'm not really fussed and looking at this bot lane, especially into Lucian and Lux. They have a lot of poke. They have a lot of damage. They're going to be able to pressure out my Ezreal and Senna and neutralize them or even take advantages over them. So bot lane is off the table. Next lane, we have Silas and we have Ari. Silas into Ari in the early game is amazing for us because Ari has no escape tools. So Silas is going to be able to E forward and throw his shackles out at Ari, set up CC for us and allow us to gank very easily. So this is a lane we want to look to punish really hard, get pressure and use Silas's move and his push to invade this Diana. And then the next lane we've got to take a look at is the final one. We've got Trindamir into set. Trindamir and set pretty even in the early game they want to take heavy trades but i'd give the slight edge to set just with this ignite with his w being able to fight trinamir in the early game he's going to be pretty strong still even uh and very snowbally so i also want to be on this top side to be able to influence this matchup and give my trinamir the lead because if he's going to be able to get that lead at all he's going to be able to take it and run and snowball with it especially into the rest of this comp there's not too much they can do against a fed trinamir so now with all of these things identified, I am basically going into this game. I'm just going to be staring at Diana on the minimap. I'm going to be looking for where she starts. I'm going to be looking for who's leashing her so that I can decide and make up my mind on where I'm going to be pathing. So I go to get a ward in the enemy's top side, but Set shows his face here and we get a pick. I'm actually going to be the one who picks up this kill. Yes, I am. So I'm going to base here, pick up a long sword and go and still do the exact same thing that I was planning on. I'm going to be planning on invading this Diana. Now, I have a long sword. It is nice. It is a bonus to me, but this does not change how I was going to play this game at all. So even just imagine it's like a fresh raw game where I don't have this uh, long sword. Everything I'm doing here is going to be the same. So right now, I'm going to start my red buff. The reason for this is because my bot lane, we mentioned before, it's weak. They don't get pressure. They need to scale. So I'm going to be pathing away from them because they provide me nothing in the early game. So we start red. And while we're doing red, I'm keeping my eye out on the minimap. Now we see Ari's in lane. Mid laners don't leash anyways. We see Set in lane, which means he's not leashing red, which means Diana is probably not starting on her top side. She can solo clear, so I'm still keeping that in mind. But key thing to take away here is bot lane has not started. 
in lane at all. We see Lucian come to lane now on the minimap, and Lux comes really late as well. So I'm thinking, all right, Diana started blue. Diana's just probably finishing a Gromp right about now. So it is now time for me to start looking to invade her top side. Now in this situation, I'm playing up two ideas in my mind. As Xin Zhao, I am really strong at level three, but I'm also strong enough at level two. Q is a really crucial move for me. So I'm deciding, do I go from these Raptors to my Gromp? Because taking Gromp here will give me level three, or do I just run it straight into the enemy jungle with, uh, with my level two? Now, in most games here, I would probably go and go to Gromp. But if we take a look here, I'm going to take advantage of my winning mid matchup. My mid laner has taken huge trades onto Ari. She's one third HP. Silas is almost, you know, two thirds more than. So I'm going to be using his huge pressure here on the mid lane to walk straight into the enemy jungle. I should have just walked straight through. That minion sees me anyway. I should have walked straight through the jungle here. And we're going to be invading the enemy's raptors. So right now, I know that Diana is actually going to be meeting me here at level 3. But I don't care. Because even if she fights me, and she is going to want to with the level lead, I have Silas in my back pocket. Diana here shows. She's looking for me while I'm on this camp. I charge my W as she's going to jump to me to get the full damage. And look at Silas in my back pocket. I know that he's rotating. I'm staring at the map. So I'm just going to start walking down to him. I'm going to start doing optimal damage. And Diana is dead here. I hold my E here just in case she flashes away. She doesn't. I use my E to cheeky little uh, kill, kill secure there from my Silas. Probably should have given it to him just to be nice. But it's mine now. Now I'm going to be able to take this red. And this game is really tough now. Set is split away from his jungler. Ari's jungler is behind, so she doesn't get any relief in this really tough matchup for her. And now I am pushing out Diana here, taking away her red buff. Uh, the game here is a pretty clean uh, sweep. I'm going to be able to get Trindamir ahead. I'm going to be able to get Silas ahead and win this game. And I end up do winning this game. But final thing to showcase here is... Silas takes a nice trade onto Ari. Not even that nice of a trade. She's almost full HP, but look what we can do here. He gets the wave in, and we're able to just dive her under tower, get her, kill her. Silas goes way too early, trades his life, but it doesn't matter. Ari loses one, two, three, four, five, six minions from that dive. She is absolutely ruined. This wave is going to bounce, and I'm probably going to be able to regank her after during this game. But moral of the story is that's why we invade. That's the decision making, and this is how to fully exploit the enemy team. Let's flip things on its head and let's talk about pathing defensively. This is the next portion of this entire video, and this is the entire opposite of what we've been addressing here before. So we spoke about invading, we spoke about split mapping. Pathing defensively is how we counter those paths. That is how we deal with these paths when we are the weak jungler. So as it says here, why? Why we do this? We are the weak jungler. We are the tanks. We are the scalers. We do not provide any pressure in the early game. We are going to be pathing defensively. And we're up against an enemy strong jungler. Something like a Kindred, the Jarvans, the Lee Sins, the Damage Dealers, the Rengars, all these guys who want to fight us in the early. We've got to do some defensive pathing. So how do we actually do this? We go back to basics. We go back to our theory. We talk about our enemy strengths. Are they a level two jungler? Are they a level three jungler? What paths can they perform? We look down here, we've got Kindred, the level two, we've got Lee Sin, the level three. And we've got to determine where they can invade us. And then we have to path to strong lanes. So if we've realized where the enemy jungler can invade us and what points they can, we need to use that information and path towards strong lanes that can defend us. For example, say we have a Darius top lane, really strong in the early game, provides a lot of pressure. We want to path towards him because if the enemy jungler invades us, our Darius can come from top lane and run all the way down to our jungle and support us. Or maybe our top lane is weak. We've got a strong bot lane. We've got a Nautilus. We've got a Draven. We start away from them. We start on the top side and we path all the way down to bot because once we get invaded on our bot side camps, then Nautilus, Draven, they can rotate and they can support us on our camps. So we've got to find our strong lanes, play towards them, and then also use the information of knowing where the enemy should invade us to build the best path for us 
as possible. And the final thing that I mention here is be adaptive and focus enemy camps. Now, what does this actually mean? What, what are these referring to? And these are examples and references to the diagrams we have down here. So let's break these down. Let's break down this one on the right here first. Say we are playing as the Zack. Zack here, he's playing towards his top side. Maybe he's got a strong laner like a Darius. Zack, he's gonna do three camps, gonna do Raptors. And then while doing Raptors, I'm gonna drop a ward in the ramp here. This is going to spot Lee Sin. Because Lee Sin, we've identified he's a three, a level three champion. He's going to do three camps and invade us on red. So while we do Raptors, we drop a ward here. And if this ward sees Lee Sin, we're just going to skip this red. Zach's going to say, screw it. I'm doing Raptors and I'm skipping red. And I'm going straight to Krugs. Now, what a lot of junglers will do here is they'll just sit here and wait for you to come to the red because they're thinking oh he's gonna come he's gonna come he's gonna come they're gonna waste a bunch of time and while he's wasting a bunch of time you're probably just doing these krugs so lee sin now has only done three camps he's still waiting for you to do this red and you've done five camps so no matter what even if you're not getting your full six camps on a clear you are still ahead you've got more camps than this lee sin you've outplayed your opponent jungler and now in reference to what i set up here before be adaptive Maybe Lee Sin just doesn't come over this ward. Then you can full clear. It's that simple. And let's look at the final uh, diagram I have for us. This is the level two champion. We are the Evelyn in this example. We are starting red buff and we're gonna be facing off a Kindred. Now, Kindred, she wants to level two invade us. So what do we do? We drop a ward in the river early game, predicting her path. If we see Kindred cross this ward here, we invade the uh the blue buff and we split map but again we go back to here be adaptive if kindred doesn't cross this ward then we can full clear so using this information and all our predictions in this game we be adaptive we plan out our paths and we play to our strengths and do the best we can so this is how we path defensively and i'm going to show you an example of how i employ this in games i play as weak champions. So jumping into this example here, we are playing Evelyn and I'm playing Evelyn into a volley bear. Now, Evelyn, we already know she's a weak champion. She's a hyperscaler. She wants to get her levels. She wants to play to level six and play towards the late game. Volley bear, on the other hand, super early pressure monster. He's got PTA for great drooling. He's got great damage. He's also got his Q, which allows him to run and stun and impact lanes really effectively. And he can also beat you in a 1v1 just in the jungle and fight you out of there. So volley bear, early game menace. Evelyn, early game weakness. So we just need to play against and a play away from this volley bear. But volley bear is a level three champion. So I'm only going to be worried about volley bear invading me once I'm level three and once he's level three. So how do I uh, play around this? So if we take a look at our team, we've got Wukong, we've got Camille. Pretty even matchup in the top lane, both hard trading, both have Ignite. Not too much I can do with that here. But we have Talon into Zillion in the mid lane. I know that Talon's gonna be able to rotate for me in the early game. So I've got my fingers crossed. I hope that guy's gonna be able to free me up. And also the most important thing here is I have got the ultimate fighting lane of Samira and Nautilus. These champions go crazy, they go in, they fight, and they throw everything at the wall and deal a ton of damage. So what am I gonna do this game? I am planning to start on the blue buff and I'm gonna path down with the support of my Talon, my Samira, and my Nautilus. Now, also on the enemy bot lane, they have Bran and Caitlyn, so they can actually get engaged on really easily by Samira and Nautilus. So they should be paying respectfully, but also they do have some trade back. C Caitlyn and Brand are quite strong into this lane. So not the ultimate lane for my bot lane, but still a strong combo nonetheless. So here, I'm just gonna showcase how I would play this as Evelyn. Right here, because I need to uh, play defensively, I'm actually not gonna ward. Most junglers, you see ward early, but me, I know that Volley Bear's only gonna be invade me once, invading once he's three, so I don't need to know where he starts. I can figure out Volley Bear's path based off who leashes and who doesn't. So right now, I'm just gonna get Wukong to leash me on my blue. I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna do this Gromp. Now, Brand and Caitlyn, it looked like they came late to lane. So I think Volley Bear is actually starting on his bot side. So Volley Bear can still three camp blue 
and invade me on my red and just invade with blue buff? It's possible, but unlikely. If he was doing an invade path here, I would assume he would do red buff, Krugs, Raptors, and then look to invade me. So I'm thinking I'm probably going to be safe here, but I still need to play defensively. So I'm going to do Wolves here. I'm going to walk down. And now I'm going to start my Raptors. And this is the key thing that I like to do as all these defensive junglers. While I'm doing these Raptors, I'm going to drag it over here and I'm just going to drop a ward right here. Because Volley Bear, he doesn't have a jump. He can't jump over Dragon Wall. He can't get around Vision. So I drop it on the ramp. And now I know and I'm 100% safe if Volley Bear is going to invade me. Now in this game, Volley Bear doesn't invade me because I play to a strong lane. I think it would be really, really disadvantageous for him to invade me this game. And he's opted to play for his top side with the TP Ignite Camille and not influence this jungle matchup. But regardless, this is the theory that you need to apply. This is the thought process you need to utilize in these games that you are playing as weak junglers because now I'm in Evelyn. I finished my clear at three minutes 19. I'm gonna get a scuttle and I'm gonna get away with murder here. I should be behind. Junglers should be putting this champion behind. I am so weak, but I'm able to get away with it using my champions to my advantage and good warding. And this is how you play a defensive. So this clear is going to be completely different from the last examples, just like the last one was. And this is denying the enemy on your second clear. So what actually is that? This is a clear where you full clear or you do your clear and you can't impact your opponent jungler. Say they're a Karthus or they're, you know, a Hecarim, something that fast full clears and it's hard for you to get in on them because if you are a Lee Sin and you're up against a Karthus, by the time you invade that Karthus, he's taken six camps and the time it's taken you to kill three and actually walk into his jungle. So it's really, really hard and disadvantageous for you to actually invade them on the first clear. So why do we do this? The enemy is a fast clear jungler, just like we said. But also another reason we can do this is the enemy has ganked on their first clear. So you have tempo over them and tempo. If anyone doesn't understand what that means, it's just time. It's pressure. You have the first move over them. So let's use this example to actually explain what that means. Say I'm this Hecarim in this game and I'm going to full clear. I'm going to do my red. I'm going to do Krugs, Raptors, all the way up through top side. And now there's no gank options up here. There's no top gank. There's no uh, mid gank. Maybe the enemy jungler took Scuttle. Or we took it and we're going to go back to base and say while we're in base, we actually see the enemy jungler go for a gank on our top laner and we're walking out of base. And usually we're just going to autopilot to our Krugs because they're respawning, right? But the enemy jangler is ganking topside, which means he probably started on his bot side, which therefore means his Gromp's probably respawning. So instead of us going from base to our Krugs, we can go from base to invading this guy on his second clear, invading his Gromp and pressuring him out that way. And just for a reference on this example here, imagine we actually are the ganking jungler here. Say we're this Nidalee and we start bot side here, we go red buff. We full clear all the way up to top side and we actually gank top lane. And this gank top lane takes so much time that the enemy uh, Raptors are actually respawning. Maybe you're up against a Poppy who solo started Raptors. You're up against a Kane. This uh, camp, if they solo start it, it's probably gonna spawn around 350, 355 around that time. If they did a buff, then a camp, that camp up here, say they did red then uh, Krugs, it's gonna spawn at 410. Cause maybe the enemy shows on bot side while you're ganking top and it's around four minutes. You can go from this top gank to actually these Krugs at four minutes 10. Or if he started Raptors, he can go to these Raptors at 350. So that's the basic premise. That's the simple explanation of how to deny an enemy on the second clear, how do we do this? We've already spoken about it a bit, but I'll go over it right now. You've got to identify which camps your enemy cleared on their first clear. So again, keeping in mind, did they start bot? Did they start top? Did they start Raptors? Did they start red? All these things are really important to know when these camps are going to be respawning. And then obviously invade their camps on those respawns. So I'm going to show you a clear I did where I denied the enemy on his second clear, denied away his camp, and I was able to get a lead through this type of play. Okay, so for our example of invading on the second clear here, I am playing Poppy. 
up against Wukong. Uh, Poppy here has a tiny little bit faster clear than Wukong does because Wukong's clear is actually quite bad, uh, but pretty neutral, uh, pretty neutral in the 1v1 as well. Both just farming champions who want to impact their lanes. And I've got some really hard scaling lanes this game, so there's not too much for me to do in the early game. So what I'm going to be doing here is I'm just going to full clear. I'm going to skip through this really quick, the first clear, because there's not too much to show. I'm just going to full clear everything. I'm actually now going to skip my Raptors in this game because I was looking to gank Darius potentially with red buff. That doesn't happen because you're going to see here in a second, my Aatrox, Aatrox just solo killed Darius. It's not much for me to do here. I'm going to take Scuttle. I'm going to take my Raptors. We're actually going to repeat this Darius. Darius dies to Aatrox, and I actually get killed by Wukong here. So this kind of sucks for me. Really sucks. Really close. Unfortunate. Whatever. We come back onto the map. Now, this is the second clear. This is where we want to be focusing. So, Kromp, uh Scuttle was still there because I know Wukong didn't take it, and I got top Scuttle. So, Wukong has actually based. I can't deny him on, on, these, uh, on this Raptors or these Krugs. So what I'm actually going to be doing is I'm going to be looking for the next camps. I'm going to be looking for the camps up here. So what I'm going to do after diving bot here, I'm, I actually get pushed off by Wukong. He's matched me. I see that his tempo is really similar to mine. I'm going to do Gromp. I'm going to do these wolves and I'm going to play just up the top side. I've got all my camps at my disposal and I'm looking to play reactively to what Wukong does next. Because if Wukong just full clears here, I can't. I can't invade, but my bot lane, it because it's clashed, they actually call out to me. They're like, oh, I think we're getting ganked. So I'm just talking to them here saying, oh yeah, maybe maybe I can invade topside if he does. So I'm just, I'm responding. I'm playing reactively here. And right now I see Wukong gank them. So as soon as Wukong ganks, we're still on this second clear. I say, all right, screw it. I know Wukong hasn't taken that Gromp. He hasn't taken his wolves. I'm going to go take them. Because Wukong gets this gank off, sure, but I'm going to punish him on the other side of the map, at least. I'm going to get, like, a consolation prize for him being able to gank my Cogmo. So this is uh, basically how you take notes and how you're able to identify how to invade and punish on the second clear. This one was a little bit messy. It's not so cookie cutter. This is how League of Legends is. You got to take all this information into your game. And it's not about invading the first camp or the second camp. It's invading whatever camps the enemy jungler skips. I know that Wukong only did his bot camps. So I know his top camps are free and open. Again, a messy example, but I think it really showcases the flexibility you can have with invading on these second clears or invading in general. And now let's wrap it up with the final clear. This is pathing for objectives. Now, pathing for objectives is somewhat similar to pathing to invade on the second clear because they involve full clearing. And that during the timing of this video is the flavor of the month. Full clearing is what League of Legends is for a jungler right now. So these are clears that you're gonna be pulling off in a lot of games. So pathing for objectives, what actually is that? It's quite simple. It is pathing for things such as Rift Herald when it spawns at eight minutes. You are uh, pathing for Dragon when it spawns at five minutes or you are pathing to invade second buff respawns such as red buff or blue buff. And the first one spawns at six minutes, 45 seconds. So why do we do this? Uh, slow games where ganks aren't an option. So if you just don't have ganks or you don't have invade potential and you're just farming and doing nothing, you can invade these major buffs to cause chaos in the game and cause a little bit of pressure. You can also do this in games where you have winning lanes, but don't win skirmishes. So what does that mean? You have a Caitlyn Zareth bottom lane. So they push a lot, but they don't really win in these river fights. They don't do too much. Or maybe you've got a Talia mid. She doesn't win in the traditional 1v1 in the mid lane or anything. She just gets push and she roams and she can help you invade camps. So how do we do this? We play very slow. We're full clear. We're just taking our camps. We're playing responsively to what the enemy jungler is. And if they give us any opportunity, we're going to punish them. So what do you do? You skip ganking and pressuring to get your camps. Play towards your pushing lane, which helps you to take objectives. So, for example, we said here with the Caitlyn and the Xerath, they get push. You can play towards this lane. You might not fight with them, but they might be pushing up bottom lane and they're going to be giving you pressure to invade this camp. They're going to be giving you pressure to take this dragon. 
and then they can have easy rotates to defend you if anything bad happens. So this one's very simple, but let's go through some of the examples of what this might look like. So this one on the right here is the two full clears into second buff respawn at 60, I mean, at six minutes and 45 seconds. So what does that mean? We've got Hecarim here. Hecarim is going to be full clearing. He's going to do red, Krugs, full clear. This is one full clear. Number one. Now he's going to full clear again, and he's going to come straight from base to these Krugs. He's going to do Krugs. Red's not up, so he's going to do Raptors. He's going to do Wolves, and he's going to do Gromp. Second full clear done. Now, if you base after doing this second full clear, you haven't done anything. Maybe you've taken a couple scuttles, peered your head into a lane, whatever. You can base, and if the enemy has started blue or they've started red, you're going to walk from base, and you're going to be level six, and you're going to be able to invade this second buff respawn. Now, you might be level 6 in this situation. If you've leached lane XP, you might be level 5. Depends on, depends on the game situation. But nonetheless, this is the invade timing and this is the path that you can pull off. I see a lot of Kha'Zixes do this as well because Kha'Zixes like to get lethality. After two full clears, they get lethality items, they get a couple extra long swords, and they demolish people on second buff respawns. Now, let's look at an example when we're looking at the 8-minute Herald. Again very very simple but it's just a full clear traditional full clear in this example i've got viego but it could be a lot of full clear champions you're going to be full clearing down towards bot let's say you full cleared this is your second full clear and on your i mean well this is like your third full clear actually because your buffs would have respawned you're going to clear all these buffs because this is the second time these buffs are spawning maybe you've ganked bot and then after your gank bot you're going to base you're going to run straight to Herald. And this is just the eight minute timer. So the eight minute timer is three full clears into a Herald start. And from this, if you also gank bot, like in this example, that means you can pull your support because your base, your support's going to be basing and your support with you can run straight to Herald. And this is actually something you see in pro play a lot. So I'm going to show you one example of me pathing for objectives and how I've played for them. It's going to be very basic, but let's take a look. So for this explanation of how to play for objectives, this game, I am playing Diana. And today I'm going to be focusing on getting an early dragon. So what does Diana do? She full clears. She clears really, really fast. She scales. And once she scales, she's a really great team fighter. But in the other game, she can take dragons really easily because she's got nice attack speed and really high damage. And if we look at who we're up against in the game, we're again up against Talia. Talia is going to be able to provide a lot of pressure in the early game, uh, fighting my team, pressuring them out, and potentially denying objectives from me. So what I'm looking for in this game is if Talia can create enough pressure on bot side to deny dragons from me, then my objective is lost. But if she's not able to do that, then I can pull a dragon. So that's what I'm playing for. I'm playing towards bot side and I'm playing to see how Di Diana reactively plays towards me. I'm just gonna full clear in this game. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through it because it's pretty simple. I'm gonna do my camps. I'm gonna do uh I'm gonna do full clear. So I've taken scuttle. So now I've full cleared. Uh Irelia was overextending up against uh Irelia. Unfortunately, my Silas dies here to the Talia and Irelia. But now my Alawi rotates down. Long story short, I trade myself to kill this Irelia here, and my entire team died. So I think we just traded three for one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, really unfortunate trades in the early game, but nonetheless, I got the kill. I get my Dark Seal, I get my Recurve. Uh, I buy my Recurve here, because this is going to allow me to take Dragon. Because on my mind right now, I'm thinking, as soon as Talia shows on the map, I'm going to take Dragon. I've still got my objective in my mind. I still know what I'm playing for this game. I just want to get this early Dragon. And getting a, a Mountain Dragon as well, really, really nice. One of the best Dragons at the moment. So here, I'm going to go back to my top camps. I'm going to start uh, Krugs. I'm going to start, then do Raptors. And I'm going to be looking for opportunities to take this Dragon. Now, some people might be wondering, okay, so when I was coming out of base, why do I not go straight to Dragon? And the reason for that is... It's really bad to leave your camps off cool, uh, off cooldown, like leaving them alive. By killing them, they're now respawning. They're coming back onto the map faster, so I'm getting XP. So this is a, a mistake I see some junglers making in lower levels. Something to keep out an eye out for is don't skip your camps unless the enemy team is actually pressuring the objective. If you have time to play with, 
Go, take your camps, put them on cooldown, then take objectives. Because even if you start an objective then and you get forced off it, that's okay because then you can base and you can just go clear your camps that are now respawning. So instead of getting one camp, you now have two camps. So that's just the general rule of thumb for why you do that. So now here, I've, full, I've taken my top camps and I'm on my bot side and I'm just looking for opportunities here. And if you take note here, I actually have a ward in the Raptors area and I have a ward uh, pink here from the fight before on her wolves. So I'm in a really good spot to pick out a great uh, opportunity to take Dragon here. We just spotted uh, Talia on the wolves pink ward here. So I'm posturing towards this Dragon. So now I'm identifying, okay, can bottom lane rotate? Can Irelia rotate? I'm really frantically looking at lanes here while I pull this dragon. I pull the dragon. I see Alistar's leaning a little bit, but it could just be him playing the lane. I'm not certain. So I'm just playing responsively, reactively, and I'm seeing, do I get away with this? Now, I've been doing this dragon for a while and no one has reacted. So I dropped the smite uh, before. You, I'm going to use my double smite charges. And it looks like I'm going to get away for, oh, for free with this dragon and just pick this up so that's the thought process going into everything i'm full clearing i'm playing away from my alawi and i'm playing around my vision and uh, the vision that's disposed to me from my laners and the previous fights and just taking advantage of talia being on top side so that's how we play for objectives and that's how my thought process going into it and why one you should be farming your camps as well and not skipping them for objectives so it's a little bit of a balance but that's the ultimate uh, the ultimate explanation behind it all. I hope you guys learned something about jungle pathing. If you have any more questions or maybe something I missed, put it in the comments below. Ask me anything. I'm be answering all the questions you guys have. Uh, if you like the video, please chuck a like. Helps out the video a lot. And if you guys want coaching from myself, please check out my website. It's in the description, uh, www.udisoft.com. And you can have coaching sessions with myself. And maybe you'll be on the YouTube channel in the future if you want to be. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye for now.